Welcome to the Allegheny East Conference of Churches. Hey everyone, we're so glad that you're here with us again on these days that we're going to be undefeated. We're going to make sure that all of our youth and as we listen to our presenters, Pastor Abraham Henry and Sister Claudia, as we delve into being undefeated. We want to be sure that as you listen to these sermons that you get engaged, you share it with somebody, you chat, you shout, you scream, whatever it is that you're feeling as you hear the word come, just do it and say it in the chat. Now remember, come back again as we do our morning and evening services so that you will always be blessed. Undefeated. Let us pray. God, we are so grateful for your presence in our life. God, in this moment, as we're preparing our hearts and our minds for your word, we want to say thank you, O oh God, for getting us right here. Lord, we're praying for this word that's coming to us through your servant. Bless your servant. Give them the power and the authority to speak your word boldly to your people because we need a word from the Lord. So God, take our hearts. Take it and seal it. Seal it for your courts above. This is our prayer. Amen.
Hey, oh, it's funny. We're in the middle of the summer, and as we're underneath here, the wind, the wind is blowing, oh, and, it is, and it is chilly. So actually, it feels good in these jackets. Listen, this one is so nice yeah, and light. It is. It is. So it is just perfect for it the is. light wind that's coming through. It is. I like it. I don't it. know if you could see, but this Oshkosh combination mm -hmm. is just awesome. Yeah. And I like how these two come together right, like this. Right. Here's what I wanted to share with everybody, that even when we look at our hats, and I like to remember the baseball caps for the, the, younger the kids. One, right? Yeah, for younger kids. What I like about this is that um, we didn't know, but we've made all of our chosen hats and uh, the visors. Mm -hmm. We've made all mm -hmm. of these. And Campery is no longer, National Campery is no longer going to be at Oshkosh, Oshkosh anymore. <laughs> so guess what's going like hotcakes? These hats because now they're turning into collectibles. collectibles right? They're mm -hmm. turning into collectibles because we're not going there anymore. And we have a good amount of them that we still want to make sure that Allegheny East people will get. Hold on. Not only our hats that we have, but these, yeah, <laughs> these the jackets. jackets for the And there's fall. some other ones too. So mm -hmm. they, they definitely have to check our website to see because right. we have some black ones and some other colors. Now another country, uh, I think it was Ecuador, they wrote us for these because they have all their kids that they want in them. But I want to make sure that Allegheny East will be the first ones to get theirs before I send, send it out, right. outside of our conference. Remember, these are collectible items, especially our jackets. These jackets are great. Okay, so where can they get in contact to get it done? To, so for them you to can get? email us or just go to our website, www.aecycm.com mm -hmm. or visit aec.org, Youth Ministries page, right. and you will get all the information there. All right. Listen, let's go ahead and do it. I know that I'm keeping a couple of them for myself. <laughs> and you know, we, we, we just might, you know, do a little special sale sure. around this time. Sure. So just stay tuned and check us out on the website. All right. So let's make sure to get this, especially through our camp meeting time. We'll have it hung up like we normally have it hung up, <laughs> where you can buy your tapes and your CDs and all that good old stuff. But we'll have it there ready for you. Just remember again, check our page, AEC, visit AEC.org, look for the youth ministry page or AECYCM.com. AEC okay, everybody? Anyway, God bless you and make sure you pick up one of these hats.
Good evening. I have just been having the time of my life with all of you. Tonight, I want to share with you uh, one that that one of my favorite books of the Bible is the Gospel of John. Uh, but one of my favorite verses in John um, is John fourteen twelve, and Jesus is assuring his disciples about his death and departure, and he's trying to provide them with comfort. And so. The chapter begins with the famous admonition, let not your heart be troubled. And here Jesus seeks to relieve the disciples with his second coming and the intimacy of he and his father's relationship. But he takes it a step further and declares, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. And this statement has often baffled me because How can any one of us do anything that Jesus did, let alone do greater works than he did? And what are these greater works that we are called to do? Um, That sounds like some crazy undefeated power. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 16, beginning at verse 16. In the Christian Standard Bible, the word of the Lord reads, Once as we were on our way to prayer. A slave girl met us who had a spirit by which we predicted the future. She made a large profit for her owners by fortune telling. As she followed Paul and us, she cried out, These men who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation are the servants of the Most High God. She did this for many days. Paul was greatly annoyed and turned to the spirit. He said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out right away. And when her owners realized that her hope of profit was gone, their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, bringing them before the chief magistrates. They said, these men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against them and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had severely flogged them, they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. Receiving such an order, he put them into the inner stocks, the inner part of the prison and secured their feet. Tonight, I believe that we get a glimpse of God's undefeated power working through people in the book of Acts. And I believe that if we are going to truly be undefeated followers of Christ, that we have been called to be undefeated, then that means that we have an undefeated hope, an undefeated faith, undefeated alliances, undefeated belief, and an undefeated purpose. And all of that comes with the kind of undefeated power that we see in the book of Acts. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, God, guide us through your word. Show us what it means to have undefeated power. In Jesus' name, amen. Beginning in Jerusalem, Acts chronicles how the apostles spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to Samaria through various Gentile cities and all the way across the Eastern Roman Empire. So that really what we see in Acts is that through the power of the Holy Spirit, the early church was a movement of believers who operated in radical community for the purpose of revolutionizing the world. 
Where do we see this? We get this thesis statement in Acts chapter 2, verse 46. The Bible records every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Now, if we really want to sit and think about this, this means that the book of Acts, while it does chronicle the acts and miracles of different apostles, for the most part, it's actually talking about the acts of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit was manifesting God's undefeated power through the apostles, particularly the ministries of people like Peter and Paul. And as we come to chapter 16, Paul persuades a young man named Timothy to join him in his ministry. And so Timothy joins Paul, Silas, and Luke as they travel into parts of what we consider now to be Europe to evangelize the people there. Now, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Paul is advised not to preach in certain cities. Verse 6 and 7 says, They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. They had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they came to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus did not allow them. And so after receiving a vision where a man is pleading with Paul saying, cross over to Macedonia and help us, they concluded that it was God calling them to preach the gospel to the Macedonians. So they traveled to Philippi, which was a Roman colony and a leading city in Macedonia at that time. And as they went out on the Sabbath day to find a place of prayer, I saw a group of women gathered just about outside the city along the river. So they preached to them and a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira. She believed and her entire household was baptized. Now, after staying with Lydia and her household, communing over the gospel, Paul and his compatriots decide that it's time to move on. And as they were on their way, once again, on the Sabbath, looking for another place of prayer. The Bible says that they were confronted by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She made a large profit for her owners by fortune telling. Now, Saints of the Most High, what I find interesting about this narrative is that while Paul and Silas are on a mission to evangelize Macedonia, while they are looking for a place to commune and converse with God, they are confronted by a girl who is bound by both a demon and by men of the city. Now, this lets me know that when you are truly out doing the work of the gospel, when you are intentionally looking for places to commune and converse with God, sometimes God is not going to lead you to a sanctuary that will allow you to safely satisfy your spiritual fix. Sometimes he will lead you to people who are bound both spiritually and socially and who are desperately in need of freedom. See, so many of us are seeking after God when we are not led to houses of worship, but we are instead led to broken people, broken people who are in bondage, broken people that we step over, that we ignore, not realizing that God wanted to commune and converse with us in the meeting and emancipation of this person, not in a house of worship. And as we study the scriptures, we must be attentive to the fact that sometimes we're not to commune and converse with God in houses of prayer. Sometimes God would have us commune and converse with him in the hearts and lives of people. Charles R. Swindle in Swindle's Living Insights New Testament Commentary Acts. He states this, quote, pagan generals throughout history have relied heavily on the services of shamans and fortune tellers to indicate the best time for battle and to inspire their troops with favorable predictions. Sometimes with someone with her abilities rather would have had a giant client base among the superstitious Romans in Philippi, end quote. Here Swindle is providing insight on the socio-historic context for which this young girl was exercising her gift of divination. And I'm going to be honest with you, while I agree that historically the pagan generals of the Roman Empire would seek counsel and confirmation on war tactics through divination, 
there are there was a phrase rather in this excerpt that troubled me and it's this scholar's assertion that this slave girl had a giant client base such language suggests that she was an independent businesswoman making profit off of her own gifting. But that's not what's written in the text. The Bible says very clearly in the first verse of her particular narrative that she was a slave who made a large profit for her owners by fortune telling. Nowhere in scripture is there any space for the interpreter to suggest that she possessed a client base that garnered her a lucrative income in this heavily pagan society. And Instead, what we see is a young girl who finds herself trapped and exploited in the spiritual and natural world. What we see is a young girl whose mind and body is bound by chains so that she is an involuntary instrument of the kingdom of Satan and a prisoner to these men of the Roman Empire. Saints, I need you to read the verse very clearly. In fact, when reading this scripture, I immediately recall the narrative narrative of Harriet Jacobs found in the book, the, the, the slave narrative incidents in the life of a slave girl. Now in her narrative, Harriet Jacob recounts, quote, I was struggling alone. Ah, hear me tonight. I was struggling alone in the powerful grasp of the demon slavery and the monster proved too strong for me. I felt as if I was forsaken by God and man, as if my efforts must be frustrated and I became reckless in my despair. Pity me and pardon me, O oh virtuous reader. You never knew what it is to be a slave, to be entirely unprotected by law or custom, to have the laws reduce you to the condition of chattel, entirely subject to the will of another. You never exhausted your ingenuity in avoiding the snares and eluding the power of a hated tyrant. You never shuddered at the sound of his footsteps and trembled within a hearing of his voice, unquote. Enslaved at the height of Rome's occupation, this young slave girl is not willfully in servitude to Satan's kingdom or the Roman Empire, but in a world that thrives off of the exploitation and manipulation of people's minds and bodies, we see a young slave girl muted by the voice of a demon literally resonating with the reflections of Harriet Jacobs. Willie James Jennings in his book, Acts, a theological commentary on the Bible, argues that in these verses, quote, a demonic spirit is making use of her body just as her owners are making use of her. Indeed, the demonic and economic are bound together here, end quote. And if we really reflect on our society today, Many people find themselves in a slavery where the demonic and the economic are bound together. In fact, according to SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, they document that while African Americans only make up 14.2% of the total population, we make up 12.4% of illegal drug use in comparison to the national average of 10.2%. The rate of binge drinking among African Americans aged 12 and up was 21.6% compared with the national average of 23%, and 3.8% of African American adults ages 18 and older had a past year mental illness and a substance use disorder, while the national average was 3.3%. In other words, many of our people are in bondage to a slavery that is both demonic and economic. They're bound to an entity that is literally destroying their bodies and their communities. And yet they see no other means of an income to survive or any other outlet to escape their condition and the trials of their life. They're in bondage to a slavery that is demonic and economic. And it's not just drugs. Sex trafficking is a slavery that is demonic and economic. Mass incarceration is a slavery that is demonic and economic. Poor diet and food deserts are a slavery that's demonic and economic. There are so many ways in which people are bound both spiritually and socially and economically. And what's crazy is the contemporary Christian church is out looking for houses of prayer. We're sitting around 
around trying to figure out how quickly we can leave this COVID pandemic and get back into our buildings. But if we're really going to be the church of Jesus Christ, if we're really going to do greater works as Jesus promised in the gospel of John demonstrated by apostles like Paul and Peter, then we've got to be willing to set aside our need to commune and converse with God in houses of prayer. We've got to become willing to commune and converse with him in the liberation of people. He, we must transition from asking the Holy Spirit how to pray greater prayers and start asking him how we do greater works. We've got to get to a point where we ask the spirit for the undefeated power that causes us to liberate people that are wrapped up in, 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 in things that are both demonic and economic. The story continues that, that she cried out to Paul and Silas, these are the men who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. They are the servants of the most high God. She did this for many days and Paul was greatly annoyed. So turn to the spirit. He said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out right away. Now in this passage, the word I'd like us to focus on is annoyed. Okay. The dictionary defines the word annoyed as an adjective, which means it's a word that describes me feeling irritated, disturbed, or bothered. But the Greek word used here is actually a verb, which means that Luke is not simply describing how Paul felt in the moment. The Greek word used here is not just communicating Paul's irritation or frustration. No, see the Greek word used here means Paul's very being was troubled. His entire being was displeased, offended, even pained at the young girl's condition. Paul was not bothered in the sense that we get bothered and annoyed by those who are disenfranchised. No, see, he did not see this young girl and roll his eyes uh, and then speak her liberation. No, Paul saw this slave girl bound by spirits and society and he was troubled. He was displeased. He was offended and he was pained. Has anybody's enslavement ever affected you like that? Have you ever heard someone's enslavement speaking out and it troubled you? Have you ever seen someone's enslavement acting out and it displeased you? Have you ever seen seen someone's enslavement drawn near to you and cling to you because of the presence of the living God in you and you see and hear and sense the totality of their condition and it offends you. Have you ever been walking about searching for a place to pray to God and you came across a person whose enslavement pained you? That's where we find Paul. We find him on the street in pain that this young girl's entire being is wrapped up, trapped in spiritual, social, and economic bondage. And to make matters worse, her bondage is being exploited for profit. See, I think it's one thing to hear about a story like that, but I think the moment that girl got in Paul's presence and he saw her and heard her, he could immediately discern her enslavement. And I believe the demon tried to affirm Paul as a means of masking himself. So he potentially would not think anything was wrong with the girl. But when the liberating power of the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, it is impossible for you to be in the presence of someone who is in bondage and not be aware of their enslavement, even when they try to hide it. And this, it, 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 it's, it's this masquerade of freedom that offends Paul and the reality of this girl's bondage that pains him so much so that he speaks life and liberty to her. And the Bible says that he speaks her freedom through the authority of Jesus Christ. And what? The immediately, the Bible says immediately, the girl is set free. How many of us can say that when we were confronted with someone's enslavement, that we spoke the life and liberty of Jesus Christ into them? See, I don't think that many of us can. And it goes back to the fact that we're constantly looking for houses of prayer to satisfy our weekly spiritual fix. Instead of seeing places of prayer as opportunities to be filled with more of God's spirit so that we can do the greater liberating works of the gospel so that we can manifest in the earth God's undefeated power. The book of Acts is literally about the expansion of the church through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It tells the story 
after the story. It tells story after story of the undefeated power of the Holy Spirit working through the followers of Jesus. There's not one sermon in this chapter, yet this narrative is included in the literary tapestry of what it means to spread the gospel, which lets us know that true gospel work is about using the undefeated power of God to give people freedom in Jesus Christ. Remember the same author that is telling this story is the same author that documents Christ proclaiming his mission and ministry in the synagogue one Sabbath day. And Luke records that Jesus went in and he read from the scrolls and he declared with all power and conviction that he has come to preach the good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And in this text, we see that the greater works of the church that Jesus spoke of was to continue the mission and ministry of Jesus. Yes, through preaching and teaching, but it also consisted of liberating oppressed and enslaved people. Willie James Jennings says, quote, Paul's words slice between structure and agency between a network of oppression and a fragile, vulnerable life. He speaks to her and to the spirit working in her, binding her body to her owners. This is what the disciples of Jesus must do. They must see beyond pious talk, religious God talk into the oppression of people, end quote. In this narrative, Paul did not simply understand this, but he was emotionally invested in fulfilling this aspect of the work. And I believe he was invested in doing greater works and bringing about liberation because he understood a principle that James H. Evans teaches in his book, We Have Been Believers in African-American Systematic Theology. And that is that, quote, because Jesus, ooh, I love this. Because Jesus is the ground of human liberation, the church is centered in the project of human liberation. Because the center of the church's life is the liberation and wholeness manifested in the life and work of Jesus Christ, this center will define the relationship between the church and the world. The church proclaims liberation from the world only to the extent that the church's ultimate center of value is God and not the things of the world. End quote. In other words, Evans is saying that because the work of Christ liberated people and he is the center of the church, then the focus of the church should also be on the holistic liberation of people. But as we continue in the story, the Bible says, quote, when her aunt, Owners realized that their hope of profit was gone. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Bringing them before the chief magistrates, they said, These men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. And so the crowd joined in the attack against them and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had severely flogged them, they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. Receiving such an order, he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet in the stocks. And it's in this moment that this precious pericope teaches us what I consider to be the most valuable lesson that we can learn. And it's that the work of liberation, when you are operating in an undefeated purpose, through the undefeated power of God, this work will disrupt. The work of liberation is the work of disruption. And here we see that when you use the undefeated power of God to liberate people, particularly people who are trapped and exploited by both demonic spirits and economic systems, what inevitably happens is you as the liberator cause a major disruption within the society. In fact, Swindle suggests that the Greek word used for disruption here actually, quote, refers to causing a riot, disturbance, 
agitation or disorder, end quote. So in other words, the moment Paul freed that girl from the grip of Satan and slavery, he caused a riot in the town because their system of exploitation had been disturbed. He caused agitation in the town because their means of an income had been disturbed. And he ultimately caused disorder in the kingdom of Satan because their host of spiritualistic confusion had been disturbed. I need somebody to hear me this, this, this evening. The, the same has been true in the history of black American liberation. Come on, let's take a history lesson. Let's take a walk back in time. See, when people were working for slaves to be emancipated, it disturbed the entire American economic structure so much so that it caused the civil war. When Dr. King called for the Montgomery bus boycott, championing African Americans rights to be free to sit wherever they wanted to on the bus, it disturbed the economy of the bus system so much so that they had to desegregate the buses. <laughs> when the Black Panther Party started their free breakfast for school children program, it disturbed the racist ideology that black children did not deserve such care while disturbing the capitalistic idea that anything offered in society must come at a cost. See, what we see here is that true freedom, freedom that truly liberates people, freedom that gives people back their power and their agency, freedom that strengthens people to go and live their life with liberty, dignity, and pursue their understanding of happiness, freedom that is empowered by the undefeated power of God. This kind of freedom is always going to disturb the systems and institutions that work to keep some people free and other people in bondage. And whenever you disturb a city doing the greater works of Jesus Christ, there's a large possibility that you will find yourself like Paul and Silas, like Angela Davis, like Dr. King, like Stokely Carmichael, like Diane Nash, like Ella Baker, like John Lewis, like Jesus Christ in the middle of a mob, stripped of your clothes, stripped of your dignity, beaten with rods, flogged and thrown in jail because freedom for all is and will always be a threat to the selfish. Today, we live in a country that is considered to be the greatest superpower in the world. And as America sits as one of the most powerful and influential countries in the world, it is also the country with the most mass shootings, the most incarcerated people, the least educated children, the most morbidly obese population, and the country with the most people abusing drugs or alcohol. More than ever does our nation need a Christian church that is more than like Christ in name. Now more than ever do we need our local communities and our nation as a whole to see a Christian church that is committed to replicating Jesus' mission and his ministry in the earth. A Christian church that is committed to unleashing the undefeated power of God in the name of Jesus. It's time we start ministries that are not so caught up in the fulfillment of prophecy that it neglects the freedom of people. In Acts of the Apostles, Ellen White, Ellen White closes her chapter on this narrative saying, quote, Satan is putting forth desperate efforts to ensnare the world. He is devising many plans to occupy minds and to divert attention from the truths essential to salvation. In every city, his agencies are busily organizing into parties those who are opposed to the law of God. The arch deceiver is at work to introduce elements of confusion and rebellion and men are being fired with a zeal that is not according to knowledge. Wickedness is reaching a height never before attained and yet many ministers of the gospel are crying peace and safety. But God's faithful messengers are to go steadily forward with their work. Clothed with the panoply of heaven they are to advance fearlessly and victoriously, never ceasing their warfare until every soul within their reach shall have received the message of truth for this time, End quote. The truth for this time is that our people are bound to a slavery that is demonic and economic. 
And it's about time we stop seeking houses of prayer to satisfy our own spiritual needs. But then instead we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us to broken and bound people. So that we might experience a kind of communion and conversation with God. That can only come when we are committed to speaking life and liberty into the lives of people. So that they too might be free. It's time the Spirit of God produce greater works in us. It's time that we tap into and unleash the undefeated power of Jesus Christ for the freedom of people and the glory of God. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Jesus, we pray that you fill us. Give us your undefeated power that we might be able to walk in undefeated purpose, that we might be able to hold on to an undefeated belief, connecting with undefeated alliances, holding on to an undefeated faith, believing in an undefeated hope. God, we pray and ask that you have your way in our lives and in our communities. May we free people and may people, because they see the undefeated power of Christ living and moving and operating out of us, may they once again believe in you and desire to be reconciled with you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray this. Amen.